Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks for coming along this afternoon. So uh, my name is Paul Conroy. Today I'm going to be talking about boosting front-end speed, or quick wins for back-end developers. It's a little bit of a mouthful, so what are we going to be talking about? So we're going to talk about uh, the, the quick and easy things that we can do as back-end developers when someone comes to us and says, there's a problem with the front-end of the website, we need you to fix it. <coughs> and when I say back-end developers, I mean, you know, those of us who are a bit more comfortable with the, with the command line, working on APIs, then dealing with NPM issues, node versions, and all the, the fun the front-end development typically brings. Um, and I say back-end developers, I also include those of us who maybe put full-stack developers on our CVs, but in all honesty are probably a little bit more, more comfortable on the back-end than the front-end. So why listen to me? Uh, so uh, you might tell from the accent, I'm not quite local here, I'm from uh, Dublin in sunny Ireland. Uh, I first started tinkering around at the web about 30 years ago now uh, as, a, as a child, playing around with Notepad, then front page, FTP, GeoCities, all, all the good fun stuff. I went off, got my qualification in software engineering, and then, as you do, took a, a brief detour. I spent a short while as the manager of the, the busiest cinema in the whole of the UK and Ireland, and after about 18 months or two years of watching my degree gather dust, decided, right, I'm gonna go back and do something I, I really love here, and, and went back into development. Got a job working as a developer in the largest classifieds website in Ireland. And then about 10 years ago, a couple of good friends of mine started a new company called Square One, and I shortly after followed them, and I'm CTO there. Square One, we're a digital agency, so we do a lot of work with uh, mobile apps, uh, web apps, PHP and Laravel is really our main uh, sort of stack that we use there. And we work with a huge variety of customers with all kinds of different problems. And a particular sector we work a lot with are online publishers. These are people for whom page speed, Google ranking, monetization, that sort of stuff are really table stakes and key. So a lot of the, the sort of the key stuff we're gonna talk about today will be examples from there. And hopefully you'll, you'll learn at least something, something new and uh, something you can take away and put into your own projects uh, fairly quickly, you know. Actionable items, everybody loves, loves an actionable item. Uh, so I, I write a bit about uh, web development on my blog at conroyp.com and I'm on most of the social networks as uh, conroyp also, that's about 50% web dev and 50% giving out about whichever one of my favorite football teams are determined to destroy my good youth mood at that time, but that's kind of how that goes. So, so where do we start? The, the beginning is as good a place as any to start. So welcome to the internet. This was uh, Tim Berners-Lee pushed this back in 1991. Very simple, a lot of plain text, uh, links to other pages of plain text, very information dense, and it worked. People liked it and it, you know, started using it and it, it grew more and more. After a couple of years, we wanted to get things a, a little more a little more advanced. So Netscape came along, we had the image tag, we got scrolling marquees, we had blink tags, we had all these really cool things. We had uh, animated GIFs of under construction, guys digging the roads, they were all over the place. And we had basic CSS, would, which would let us start to apply slightly richer styling than we saw on the, the original web page. And once we got a little bit of basic CSS, you know, as developers, you give us an inch and we'll take a mile, we started getting a little bit more sophisticated. Now this was a site called the, the CSS Zen Garden. And this was absolutely mind-blowing at the time in that you would have one HTML document and then whichever CSS file you chose to load would completely change the layout. You'd have boxes jumping all over the place. You go from having this kind of nice, sedate, beauty salon type lookout to some futuristic robot thing purely by changing the CSS. So there was a real power in the styling alone. And with that kind of enhanced uh, visuals, we then wanted a little bit more interactivity. So we're looking at Java applets. We had Flash and then JavaScript became more and more uh, mature in the browser and let us do richer and more interesting things. And that leads us to the position we are in today where we can do incredibly sophisticated things. You know, we can have a fully fledged video player dropped into our web pages and have it just work with a very small amount of code. And that'll, that'll just work pretty much out of the box. Same with sort of social media embeds from Twitter or Facebook or these sort of things. And we can have these type of sites. This is something that's very sort of standard looking news websites that we all be familiar with. You know, we have these kind of Google ads up the top. We've got images, we have different fonts, social media icons, all these weird and wonderful things together. And all of this uh, stuff means that the, the, the browser is, is working a little bit harder to make all of this uh, come together uh, nicely for us. And it's not just the browser working a little bit harder. You know, this, this whole ecosystem has started to evolve. And over the years, we went from plain CSS to CSS preprocessors, the SAS SCSS. We have uh, frameworks and uh, toolkits. You know, we have um, Bootstrap, we have Tailwind. On the JavaScript side of things, we have package managers. We have Bower, then we moved to NPM, we have Yarn. jQuery has been, been around, feels like almost since day one on the internet. It's, I saw that uh, version four came out last week. I didn't even know it was still a thing, but it's, it's still, still going strong. 
other front end frameworks, Angular, Vue, React. So there's, there's a lot going on here, and a, a lot of complexity has developed over the years so we can deliver richer experiences. And this leads to kind of increased specialisms. You know, so on the front end, there's a lot of this stuff happening. We see the concept of back end and front end developers start to become separate, separate specialisms, and a lot going on here. And at the same time now on the back end, you know, we, we've been going through a lot of these changes as well. We've gone from a thousand line long PHP 4 functional files into the latest and greatest PHP 8.3, some of the stuff Derek was talking about this morning, uh, Symfony, Laravel, all these sort of frameworks. So there's a lot of specialization going on on all sides here, which is great and leads to richer experiences overall, but can be a little bit tricky when you're spending all of your time in one camp or you're very comfortable in one camp and you're suddenly asked to help out on the other side. So you know, if you're a back-end developer, you're, you're dealing with PHP, it's, it's single-threaded, everything happens in a sequence, and, and then you're asked to deal with some quirky things happening on the front end, you've suddenly got JavaScript race conditions, you've got weird ads jumping in and things moving around, and it, it can be a little bit, little, bit, uh, little bit difficult to get into that. And you know, when you're asked to do more and more sophisticated things as a back-end developer, you know, let's, let's make this thing look a little bit nicer here, and you're, you're battling in the CSS, it's just, it's just not respecting what you want it to do or what you think it should do. Or worse, you eventually get everything working and it's, it seems to be looking all right, you're ready to launch, and then you just find, oh, there's one browser that's just decided, nope, sorry, I'm gonna do this ever so slightly differently here, and it's, it's always Safari. Um, and my, my personal favorite, you, so you're building an application, everything looks good on the back end, it's all, all good and ticking along. You have a little bit of a front-end component, install a few node modules, build it, put it together, all that's fine. Everything's ready to go, so you walk away, I'm gonna go make myself a congratulatory cup of tea here for five minutes, come back to my desk literally five minutes later, and in that time, NPM and Node have gone through three whole release cycles, two versions of which broke all backwards compatibility, one of my libraries has been discontinued, and I need to just basically throw it away and start again. So this, this can, be, can be frustrating uh, if, if you're jumping from one sort of side to the other. But then we do get a lot of be benefits from this complexity, you know, we talked about fully fledged video players and the much richer web that we have today. You know, if we were to say, all right, so back end developer, uh, Paul, you love spending all of your time working with the, with the command line, with APIs, with the back end, you just want functionality above all else. So, okay, let's forget all of this complexity and let's, let's see what the internet looks like if, if you were to just build the internet the way you want it. And it's, it's functional, uh, it gets the job done, but you know, we're, we're not gonna be winning any design awards anytime soon. But at some point, uh, as someone who's more focused on the back end, at some point, whether you're maybe the only person on the team or there's a small team or your entire front end team quits at some point after we've chosen the wrong JavaScript framework or something like that, someone is gonna come to you and say, the site's slow, we need to fix it, we need to do something about it. Now you might look at your metrics, you'll say, well, database is responding quickly, API seems fine, Nginx, that's everything, is, the server is sending the data out fine. So well, what do you mean by slow? And you'll often hear back, well, you know, just when I go to the website, it feels a bit janky, or it's, oh, it's a bit kludgy, or it's just a bit meh. And, you know, meh is, is, is not a great technical term to try and dig into and, and, and build a, an improvement plan around. So what we've been kind of lucky with over the last few years is that there, there's a big move towards getting more metrics around defining, defining what exactly meh feels like, or what, what it is, and putting a number on it that we can plot against over time. There were tools like GT Metrics and Y Slow that sort of started this and eventually gave way to uh, this sort of image in the middle. We'll talk about this tool quite a bit. It's Google's PageSpeed Insights. And this tries to put, uh, well, objectively quantify performance. So put a, put a hard number on how your website is performing overall, taking the back end into account in terms of how fast the server responds, but really a lot of it focuses on how the front end is, is interacting and working. Uh, Core Web Vitals is the term that Google coined a, a couple of years back to try and really quantify some of the feeling. Uh, you know, when you're on a website and you're, you're scrolling around and it's, it's scrolling but it's not quite as responsive as you want it, or it, it's loading in but things are kind of jumping all over the place for a minute while it settles, these type of things, they're annoyances, but how do we quantify them? That's Core Web Vitals, so we'll, we'll dig into these a little bit. And what Google did as a kind of a sweetener for people to, to actually care about these and work with them is they do include it as part of the ranking signals for the, the performance of your, your website. So there's a lot of these core web vitals, but there's kind of three of them that are the key ones that come up again and again. Uh, CLS, LCP, IMP are the ones we, we hear a lot about. So CLS stands for Cumulative Layout Shift. Uh, it basically means how much do things jump around on the page? So we think about when you go to a news article on your phone, you're scrolling down, you're reading a bunch of text, and then suddenly an image appears in the middle, it was very slow to load, and the text on the bottom half of the page jumps. That's a shift in the layout, it's not good, so ideally you want no shift to be happening, that's what CLS measures. 
the LCP is the largest contentful paint. So what's the biggest thing on the page when you first load it, and how long does that take to load? Again, open your phone, go to any news website, you're probably gonna see a giant image there, maybe takes up 50% of the page. How quickly does that image get rendered? That's what LCP will try and, uh, try and measure. Again, the lower the better. And IMP is interaction to next paint. If you are on a web page and let's say you tap the, the hamburger menu, how long does it take until the menu actually appears? Or there's an accordion, you tap the, the arrow, does the thing appear immediately? Is it a bit juddery, that sort of stuff. So that's what these metrics try and, try and capture. And with these metrics, we now are lucky enough that we have a number of different online tools that we can point at and we can use to try and measure these uh, stats over time. And one of them is Google Search Console. So within this, you put your domain into Search Console and it will show you the stats over time for these core web vitals. So the, the red ones are bad news, the yellow need a bit of work, and the green one they're, they're happy enough with. This is based on real world data from Chrome users. So if you use Chrome and at some point you have opted into anonymously share performance or something like that, that's where this data comes from. And the Search Console, you know, it's a great tool for uh, your website's presence in general. It'll manage sitemaps, crawl errors, all of that sort of stuff, but there's a, there's a big section in it that you can keep an eye on this performance. Now, the big caveat, the big problem with this is that if you see a massive red line here, you see, okay, there's a problem, I know what it is, I'll fix it, I push a change live, I come back in tomorrow, I check Search Console again, you're, you're not gonna see the change here. So the, the real world Chrome user data, it only gets published about once a month. So you potentially have a lag of 25 to 30 days here before you see your, the impact of your change, which is not ideal when you're, you're trying to validate, okay, is this working well in the real world with, with real world user conditions? So you can get a little bit more real time. And that's where Google's Page Speed Insights tool comes in. So you can put a particular URL into this, and for both mobile and desktop, it'll give you a, a top line score between one and 100. So higher the better here on, on how it feels that your, your site is working. In addition to this, it'll break down the individual uh, core web vital metrics. So you know, we see our largest contentful paint, our CLS, there's a few other things going on here. And then interestingly as well, they'll give us these kind of pointers down here where they will tell us for the things we're not doing so well on, it'll tell us, okay, your, your LCP is doing poorly. We can click into that and it'll tell us, this is what we think your LCP is and you need to work in this area. So it can really help us to, to improve the, the data there. Now what it'll do is it will also mix lab and real world data. So this real world data is effectively pulling the same information that we saw in the search console with the same kind of issue with the lag, but it'll tell you what people in the real world are seeing when they visit your website. And the, the lab data is Google running the page speed tests on a, on a virtual machine somewhere and, and giving you the one to 100 score. One small note with this is if you put a URL into PageSpeed Insights, you get, a, you get a bad score. If you immediately deploy a fix, push it to your website, it's all looking fine. You're not gonna see that reflected for usually about half an hour. There's a bit of a server cache. So it's a lot better than Search Console in terms of feedback. It's not, not quite ideal if we're into like a, a, a really iterative development cycle. It also needs the URLs to be publicly accessible, which isn't always gonna be the case when you're developing locally. So what we can do instead is we can use a Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is effectively PageSpeed Insights in your browser in Chrome. When you go into the developer tools, there's a tab here and it will run all of the same tests and all of the same metrics. So this is really good when you're developing locally and you just wanna keep getting feedback again and again and again. Now one of the challenges with this one is that it can be very impacted by conditions on your machine. So if you start Lighthouse running and then I'm on my laptop, I go and I move on to, I don't know, I'm, I'm using Slack or some other Electron app that's just eating up the CPU, Chrome has less CPU, and that will lead to different performance scores. So there can be a lot of variation there, which can be kind of frustration when you're getting very different scores on a run to run. So ideally what you want is you want to be able to run these type of tests, but maybe run it in a, a stable and static environment that you can get the same results over time and we can kind of monitor our performance as we go and get an idea of whether the changes we're making have any kind of impact. And uh, fortunately, there's a package for that, uh, a Spashy package. Uh, called Lighthouse PHP. And what that will do is that will let you run headless Chrome uh, on, a, on a virtual machine or a server somewhere, uh, get snapshot of the stats, and you can record them. So the API is really, really simple. Put in a URL, you run it, you get a bunch of scores back, and then you can store these somewhere. So what we do with a number of our clients is we take, say, a Laravel Jetstream is, is great for getting uh, dashboards and, and simple websites up and running with authentication very quickly. So we have a, a tool internally where we will just store a bunch of uh, web URLs, Every hour we have a cron that runs and this will just go off, run Lighthouse against all of these and then it'll aggregate our scores over time. So this is great for us to be able to look at this and see, okay, something, something funny went on here or here. Uh, maybe did we do a deployment or something else weird has gone on. It lets us get that kind of view over time 
to, to get a better idea of what we're doing both at top level and on the individual metrics. Now one of the things here is you'll notice that we have on our tool here, we, we record both the score here and we also do a rolling average. And the reason for this is you'll notice the score is incredibly noisy here. And your score will often be quite noisy if your website has a lot of, say, third-party dependencies. Uh, Google Tag Manager, Google Ads, maybe Facebook Pixels, third-party trackers, that sort of stuff, where you know Facebook CDN has a bit of a hiccup and suddenly your page speed is showing you all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And ideally, we want to know, well, we, we need to know that information because that's what users are ultimately seeing, but as the developers of the application, we also want to know the stuff that's immediately in our control. What's, what's going on? Is it, is, it, is it working? Are we causing problems or not? So one thing you might consider doing is adding uh, like a, a no ads equal one URL toggle to your application. And what you would do in this case is you would listen for this toggle and when it appears just in your application, you don't load Tag Manager, you don't load the ads, you don't load the third party stuff. It's effectively the stuff that we have built that's fully in our control. And it's, it's not a usable website by any means. You know, you're taking away a lot of the stuff that adds a lot of the value, but it means that as you monitor those effectively internal URLs, you have a very good idea that if those scores start jumping around, it's probably something you've done uh, or something you've improved. So you can, you can get, that, get that idea a little bit better. So now we kind of know what a uh, slow website is. We've agreed kind of metrics around it. We know different tools we can use to monitor, monitor it. Uh, but the next question is, what exactly are we going to do about it? So we have a few different options here. Uh, one of the options, so uh, Joel Spolsky. Joel Spolsky, uh, I don't know if you, you, you know, he was the co-founder of Stack Overflow. And he worked on the Excel team in Microsoft Office back in the day. And this was back in the day, you know, where, where releases were shipped on CDs and not small patches afterwards. So releases were, were big, big things. And they had a problem in Excel that they had a just really nasty performance issue. And the app would get slower and slower over time. And it was, it was causing them a lot of problems. And they had a big new banner release coming up. So the team went on big projects, you know, nights, weekends, death march project to get this done, re-architect the app, rebuild a lot of it. And, and they did it. It took them a long time, but they did it. They hit the release. It went out and performance went up. It was good. But funnily enough, around the same time, the old application's performance also went up and wasn't a million miles off what they'd, what they'd achieved. And this was because in the meantime, the Pentium chips had come out. And suddenly, just the, the rising tide of Moore's law had managed to just give everyone a free performance boost just by continuing to ship. So uh, the point was that, you know, for, as far as Microsoft were concerned, they might as well have sent the whole team snowboarding for six months. And then at the end of six months, everybody comes back and says, uh, yeah, I'm nice, I'm relaxed, I'm fine, and I'm ready to go again. And our performance hasn't changed that much versus what they did have, which was a team that were completely burnt out, shattered, and, and so on. So maybe your, your first option when your boss says the, the website is slow is, right, I'm going to go snowboarding for six months, and it'll sort itself out in the meantime. Or, or maybe, I don't know, this is maybe a, it's not snowboarding, it's vi Vision Pro, and you imagine you're on a beach somewhere or something like that. But um, so you tell your boss, right, don't worry about it. The, the, the market will take care of it. It'll be fine. I'll see you in six months. So. Uh, if, if you have a job where your boss will say okay to that, then congratulations, that's, that's great, and uh, le let me know if you're hiring. Uh, but the rest of us are probably going to need something a little bit more practical. So when we talk about page speed issues, it is normally uh, one or more of these lads are going to be the problems. Uh, images, ads, videos, and fonts. So they're the things that really give us the rich experience and, and make the websites nice, but we pay quite a tax for each of them. So uh, you know, if we're, we're taking a big page speed hit from these guys being there, we do have one very simple solution uh, for getting rid of all of the page speed issues related to all of them. And that's going back to our back-end developer type of website. So you asked us to improve the page speed score. Amazing score. Job done. Thanks very much. I'm on my holidays. See you later. So uh, I, I said you'd get actionable uh, insights here. And the action is probably going to be you getting fired. So maybe we'll, we'll look at something a bit more, a bit more practical. So we start with images. Uh, so images, on average, 60 to 65% of pretty much any page you'll go to will, will be uh, image resources. And this can be particularly tricky to manage if you have an application that is dealing with a lot of user-generated content. So let's take, for example, here, this is a, a sports website. And the, there'll be a CMS somewhere. The authors can come in. They can write the article whatever way they want it. And they can drop in images to, to highlight it and make it a really visually engaging thing. Now, one of the problems here is that the authors, uh, it's a sports website, so they deal with sports photo agencies, which give us these beautiful photographs. But these photographs are all 6,000 pixels wide and about 10 meg in size. So they're not, they're not ideal. The authors drop them in. Our app is just a very naive app. Whatever you save, we'll just go and dump it on the front end. And that's, that's end of story. So how do we do on our, our page speed here? Well, it's not good. 
So we have this big scary red red number here tells us it's, it's, it's not good. So when we look at the particular hints as well for the, the page speed tool to tell us what we should focus on, it'll tell us, okay, we should be properly sizing these images. We have a huge potential saving here. We're wasting a lot of, a lot of size. So one option, we make sure that when we have an image, we're putting specific height and width on it. So that means if someone does upload this 6,000 pixel wide image, it's not gonna blow up our layout and make things look crazy and wacky and all of that sort of stuff. The downside to that is the browser will resize it to 640 by 360, but we're still downloading the, the 10 megs, so it's not, it's not ideal. So the other option is to make sure that we are outputting an image that has been specifically sized for the dimensions that we want. So in this case, we maybe we could use a, an on-demand image resize or maybe something like Cloudinary, or you could spin one of these up yourself. Or if you use, say, a WordPress or a Spashy's media library, a common pattern is when an image is first uploaded, your application knows all the different sizes you'll use, you resize it at that point, and then you use them later on like this. So different approach there. And so what we've done now is we have a, the file that's being downloaded is the appropriate size. So it should be a much, much smaller file size. And it makes a big difference. So our performance score can shoot way up. It's not perfect yet, we still have a bit of work to do. We're, we're quite happy about uh, the way our scores have moved up here uh, until we notice this ominous looking uh, mobile tab at the top here. So we've been looking at desktop. We tap on that and we see, oi, okay, this is, this is not good at all. So we, we'll dig in a little bit here and see, we're, it's a responsive site, it's the same markup, so what's, what's going on? Properly sized images again, and this serve images in next gen formats. Y you often see the two of these together. It's basically Google saying, your images are too big. You're, you're, they're too large for what you're, you're trying to show here. So what we can do is try and serve the right size. So this pattern might be familiar, uh, particularly if you've done a lot of WordPress development, uh, where you will have something like a, a library that detects what the user is based on their, their user agent. So are they mobile, tablet, or default desktop? And then based on that, we'll just output whatever the, the image size that we determine they should be. So this is a relatively common pattern. Problem with this is that it really makes mincemeat if you're using a, like a URL-based caching pattern. So imagine I have a web, uh, website and a person A comes along on a mobile device, visits my homepage, I'm caching that for 10 minutes. Two minutes later, person B comes along on a, a desktop device, they're getting the, the cached markup from the mobile user, which, which is no good for them. Or I now need to have my caching aware of not just my URLs, but also this division in sizes, my cache and validation gets more complicated, it's, it's not ideal. And it's also problematic then if someone does load the page and then resizes it, it, it doesn't redraw, so it's, it's a bit of a, a nasty user experience. So the alternative we have is using an image tag with this source set. So what we'll do here is we will serve the same markup to everybody, and what we're doing here is we're defining in one place, we're telling the browser, okay, we have a mobile file, we have a tablet image, we have a desktop image, and these numbers at the end, we're giving it sizes to, to help the browser understand, okay, how big this is, when do I want it to, to be shown to a user based on the, these media queries. So the browser will then take over the work that says, okay, if I'm at a, whatever, a standard mobile uh, width, then I know my, my width is whatever definition, I'm gonna load the mobile image. So it'll, it'll do all of that. And this means now our, our single URL cache is fine. We're serving the same markup to everyone. Very simple for us as, as backend developers, we generate this once, it's done. We don't have to worry about what sort of weird and wonderful devices people are coming to. You know, it's a phone, it's a tablet, it's a smart fridge or, or whatever it is. So we're, we're good from that point of view. One thing here that can be a little bit fiddly though is working on these, these size definitions, uh, particularly when you start to get like high density devices. So say like um, the Apple phones, which report as being a certain width, but really want a much higher density image. It can be a bit fiddly. So if, if you are using something like a uh, Spashy's media library, there's a really nice feature in it here where you can uh, just tell it I want to use responsive images. And then in your blade template or twig or your article.inc.php or whatever way you, uh, you output your, your stuff, it will go ahead and it'll automatically calculate all of these, these sort of sizes for you. So this, is, this can be a big time saver if, if that's a package that you have, have the option to use. So at this point now, we have images are being sized correctly for the, the user. So we're, we're making big steps in that direction. But we can do a little bit better here. And that is uh, WebP. So this is an image format that Google rolled out about 15 years ago so now, but it uh, gives you somewhere in the region of a 25 to 30% file size reduction compared to JPEG or PNG with really very little visual difference in, in the compression, so really effective compression. It's been supported in, in the core of PHP for a couple of versions now, so any of the libraries built on top of it can convert to WebP fairly easily. The services I mentioned like Cloudinary also also very good as well. Uh, so it was launched about 15 years ago. It being a Google format, Chrome supported it effectively immediately. But uh, the other browsers took a little bit of time. So we can uh, see 
what the support is like on different different browsers. So uh, I d for any of you who haven't come across this before, this caniuse.com is a fantastic resource that lets you very quickly see what support is like across the different browsers for particular uh, features in the browser, JavaScript, APIs, that sort of stuff. Really, really useful when you're trying to figure out, do I need a polyfill for this, or can I just do the, do the easy thing? So we can see here support is, is generally pretty good, uh, unless you're, you're stuck supporting IE 11, then you're, you're out of luck. Um, but I guess in this day and age, if you're still spoke, stuck supporting IE 11 at this stage, you're, uh, you're probably out of luck generally in life at this stage. Um, but so this means now we're, we're doing quite well. So our images, we've got them uh, served at the right sizes. We've, we've shrunk them down using WebP across pretty much all of our browsers. So our, our time to load and our LCP metrics are going to start looking very good. But what we haven't really looked at yet are things like our layout shift. So our images might be small. They load a little bit quicker. But we're loading our images in the middle of our article. We're still pushing the text down underneath them. So the solution here is, is, is nice and simple. So what we want to do is make sure we're reserving the space. So we know, because we are now sizing the images correctly in our, our application, we know what sort of height we should expect at any different resolutions. What we can do is we can tell our image container here, OK, uh, just always reserve a height of 250 pixels. So the browser will just reserve that height, and then the image will just load into it at some point. But it means that the content around it won't reflow, won't redraw, that sort of stuff. And now we also know we've got different devices to support. So this, this media query in CSS, it's it's a fairly, fairly simple little thing. It's just telling the browser at, at different sizes, apply different, different heights. And what that means is we have a web page. It's loading very slowly here. And what we can see is we don't have that, that janky jumping up and down. We have this space here in the middle. And you can go the extra mile, you know, maybe put in a little background shading or something so it's clear to the user that something is loading in. But it's, uh, it, it means that our CLS has, has, been, um, has been knocked on the head. We're doing quite well with it. And this will work here. You know, most of these examples we'll all use sort of landscape images. And just a slight, slight tangent here. Talk a little bit about portrait images because uh, portrait images, sa same rules apply. We can constrain them by height, uh, but uh, they often end up looking a little bit, a uh, little bit wonky a lot of the time. So you end up with this, this kind of effect here, where you'll have the constraint of the height, but you've got this kind of weird padding at the side, and, and the, the the contrast isn't great here. But you know, this caption at the bottom, if it's a bit grey, maybe it looks weird if it's full width. It looks even weirder if it's short width. So doesn't look great. So what, what can we do here with relatively little effort? Because you know, remember, we're, we're back-end developers just entering into enemy territory here. So what can we do here with very little effort to make this look a little bit less, a little bit less nasty? And one option is very simple. We just wrap a div around the image, make sure the image is centered in it, and then we're just going to put background color in. So this background color will match whatever the, the caption is, and it just fills it out a, a little bit more. Um, but we can do a little bit better here, and we can add a little, little, little bit of pizzazz here. So think about if you're watching the, the news on TV, and at some point on TV, they are showing a video that somebody has shot on their phone, and it's portrait video. And when they need to show that video on a landscape screen, they, they don't leave the background blank. They need something there which is going to be visually interesting to your eye, but at the same time not be distracting from the main video that they want to show you. And uh, they'll often end up with something a little bit like this where you end up with a, like a blurred version, uh, enlarged and stretched out. And we can do this relatively easily through, through CSS. So we take our, our wrapper, and we add a, a pseudo element, a before element here. And the nice trick here is that we're going to set a background image on this, this container, but we're setting the background image to be the same image that we're using here already. So we're not doubling up the assets we need to load. We're, we're reusing the same thing. We're effectively getting it for free as far as our page speed is concerned. And we'll, we'll, we'll get it this kind of blurry effect. So the idea here is you know, it's, it's blurry enough that uh, it's not distracting you from the central image, but it's, it's, it's still specific enough that you can see it's related. Your brain can see it's, it's, not, you know, it's, it's not a strange thing in here. Uh, now, the eagle-eyed amongst you, uh, or the eagle-eyed sitting in the first few rows, I don't know what the size of the, the code is at the back there, will notice a bunch of these magic numbers in here. And I know myself, my, my, uh, my, the, the hairs on the back of my neck tend to stand up when I see magic numbers in these things and wonder you know, how, how specific and hard-coded is this. So what these numbers basically mean is the, the, the blur of 15 is the intensity of the blurring that we want to apply. And 15, trial and error, uh, seems to be about the sweet spot that matches roughly this sort of effect that you, you'll see on the TV. But the problem with the blur filter is that when it gets applied, what it will do is it effectively adds a halo around the whole image. It softens the edges of the image. And what we want is, we don't particularly want a nice big uh, soft halo around the edge here, because that will then draw your eyes to this, which isn't really what we want to do here. So with the blurring of 15, what we want to do is we want to have the background image technically come out 
15 pixels wider in each direction, and then we're just going to show the, the central container. So that's what the, this absolute positioning and this, this width stuff is, is doing there. So that's what those, those magic numbers are all about. So just a little bit, a little bit extra work here, no impact on our, our page speed, and just makes our pages look a little bit, little bit richer, a little bit nicer to look at. Our page speed overall now on our mobile is looking quite good. We've stepped up quite a bit. Our CLS, our layout shift is, is looking much, much better. Um, so when we look at, okay, we're at 82, there's still room for improvement. So what, what are we talking about here? So defer off-screen images is one of the things we're being warned about now. So imagine when you go to, uh, let's take a news article again as, as an example. You load it on your phone. You can see a certain percentage of it when you load it, but there's a lot of it that you won't see when you first load the page. And if we have image tags off your device, if we're loading those images, you might never scroll down. So you're taking the hit for loading the image when you might never see them. So ideally what we want is we just want to load those images in at the last moment, and the technique for that is, is called lazy loading. So we want to save a huge amount of bandwidth to do this, and the idea here is that you know, this is a, the box at the top here is, is what the user can see, and we have a placeholder here, it's just some uh, CSS and text, and it's only when this image crosses the threshold that we want it to load and we've taken the hit on it actually loading in. So, so lazy loading, really popular technique. It's popular because it's incredibly effective. You think about how many images you see on, on web pages, there's a really great way to, to reduce the, the load burden on our users. And it's, uh, this isn't a new thing, you know, people have been doing this for, for a very long time, and the way this used to work was you would have a polyfill library of some sort, you would have your image tag, you would blank out the image source so the browser would load nothing by default, you'd use a data attribute for it, add a class, and then you'd bind it using jQuery or, or something like that. And what this would do is it would add a listener usually into the, the window scroll event. And every time you scrolled, it would check, is there anything that has a lazy load class that is now just about to come into view? If so, swap the data source for the source, show the image, and, and happy days. But the problem with this is that if I have my, my laptop here and I just flick like that to scroll down the page, to me, that's one scroll event. To the browser, that's about five and a half thousand. And as Chrome and the browsers developed, this became more and more problematic to the extent that they would actively warn against using this sort of scroll thing because it, it trashes the rendering thread and it, it blocks things up quite a lot. But this is a hugely popular technique and it, it's very effective. So the browser manufacturers got together and said, okay, well, if we're gonna tell people they can't do this, we need to tell them what they can do. And they swapped all of this stuff here, said, okay, let's just do this. Loading lazy, one single attribute, we drop that in. And the browser then will use its own heuristics to decide, okay, am I on a mobile device with a slow connection or I'm a desktop with a fast connection, whatever it is, and the browser will figure out at what point in the scroll it needs to load those images. So I mentioned it's a relatively new attribute, nice and simple, nice and easy. So we come back and we, we look at our support again and we can see, okay, support here is pretty good, though, again, IE 11, you're, you're at a, I don't know. If you're, if you're working with IE 11, maybe you need to go back to the, the lads whose boss lets them go snowboarding for six months and see if they'll, uh, they'll take you on. But um, generally, this is, this is a great attribute that can really make a big difference. So the temptation here is go into our code, and we're gonna say, right, find and replace all, please. So is it a good idea to, to go in and, and replace absolutely everything? Um, I can see a few nervous heads. I know it's the, the Friday session after lunch. That's, that's a rhetorical question, don't worry. There's not, not, not our audience participation needed. So we, do we lazy load everything? Well, no, we don't. So this section here, the red box at the top is what you will see in your browser when you first load the page. So we refer to this as above the fold. It's, it's an old newspaper term for when papers were folded, what you can see when you first open it up. And the thing is that the browser is working massively hard that everything it can find in here, the images, the fonts, everything like that, it's trying to load those as quickly as possible. And if we come along and say, well, yes, here's an image, it's great, it's right at the top of our page, but uh, yeah, you can load it lazily if you want, the browser gets very confused and conflicted and it will actively warn us in page speed that you're, you're doing something very contrary here, this is, this is not good. So below the fold, absolutely, but you need to have a little bit of awareness of where the image is, so it's not quite a global find and replace. But it's, it's incredibly effective. And uh, it being built natively into the browser means that we're also not paying the penalty of a bunch of extra JavaScript libraries on top of it. So really, really, really impactful thing we can do. So we look at our page speed again, it's, it's, it's looking even better, um, but we still have some hints here complaining about things that we could do better. And we're still being told to fair off-screen images. But we've gone in, we've, we've replaced all of our image tags with loading lazy, we've unreplaced the ones at the, at the top of the page after we, we made that mistake but we're still getting a complaint about this. And what we can see, the example we're being given here, it's not an image tag, it's a div, and uh, the div has the image being loaded as a background image. But what about our, our lazy loading? Well, uh, the problem that we have 
is that lazy loading is not natively supported for, for background images. And uh, this, this slide was unfortunately put together before the keynote this morning, so uh, I'll have to remove all the Star Wars references for the, for the next time I give this talk. But the, the, the idea here is that, uh, yeah, the browsers don't support it as of yet. So, and this is, this is unfortunate because background images tend to be quite heavy ones. You know, you think about their, they're in the rear of a hero section or something like that. They tend to be quite large, quite wide, and they tend to be quite um, heavy file size wise. And you store them in the background image. Some polyfills used to support loading them, some don't. So again, the browser manufacturers are looking at ways we can make this a little bit more effective. And there's a little bit of JavaScript coming up here, but nothing, nothing too crazy, I, I promise. Um, and the intersection observer is what we're doing to replace the, the window scroll. And the intersection observer, it is a way to observe when two items intersect, so it's very, very well named. So what we'll do here is we'll have our div. We have a, a div here that has a background image. What we're going to do is we're going to define it on the markup here, so we don't need to go messing around with CSS files or recompiling or doing anything like that. We'll, we'll stick it on the markup. And then within our intersection observer, the, the main function in here is, is going to be this one. So we're, we're saying what we want to, to observe, what we want to happen, and then we're, we're triggering it. And what we're doing here is, with the intersection observers, we're saying, OK, this is a function that we want to run whenever an intersection happens that meets this criteria. So the root margin of 100 pixels. This is an optional thing where, by default, this function will run whenever, say, this, this entity crosses our, our user viewport threshold. But what we've done here, I don't know if you, you can see it at the back here, we've put a little red line here, which is about 100 pixels down below. Because we know this image is large, so it might need a little bit of time to load in so it's there by the time the user is ready. That's what our root margin is going to do. It's a little CSS definition. And the intersection function will fire. And all the intersection function is going to do is it's going to check when an intersection happens. We're going to go for, uh, we're going to put CSS in JS. Uh, it's good, good fun. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our uh, data set background image. We're just going to apply it as the background image in CSS. And then critically, we're going to unobserve the thing. The job is done. We don't need to be watching it anymore. And uh, that's, that's it. So we now have our, our images at the right size. It's good news. Uh, they're being shrunk down. They're being served in the right sizes for mobile, desktop, and so on. Page speed is moving in the right directions. And we're really feeling good about the fact that our page speed problems are really getting a, getting a handle on them. Uh, but we still have some, some kind of nasty things hanging here trying to hold us back a little bit. And one of the problems with ads is that no, no one really likes ads. But the problem is that they, you know, they, they pay for the internet. They pay for many of our jobs. And we'd, we'd like to keep our jobs, ideally. So our jobs as developers is just to find ways to make this work a little bit more smoothly. One of our challenges here, coming back to our, our asynchronous problem, is that as developers, we've no, absolutely no way of knowing if an ad is going to show, or even the size it's going to be, uh, until after an ad server responds. And all of that happens after the page loads. None of this is controlled server side. We get this jumping effect here. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, where the page kind of bounces around. Really bad for CLS. Uh, very annoying for users. I, I know it's happened to me a million times. I'm sure it's happened to some of you, where you're, you're scrolling on an article or something, and as you scroll, you go to tap to scroll, and suddenly you've hit an ad, which was, wasn't there a second ago, and you're frantically hitting back to try and get out of it. Uh, you, but you might look at that and say, well, you might have been annoyed by that, but you, you click the ad. You know, a click is a click at the end of the day. So if the publisher gets the money for that ad, are they, are they really that incentivized to fix these? these minor annoyances, um, and they're, they're very much incentivized. So Google has gotten very good at detecting when people click things by accident. So if I click an ad and then I'm back on the original page in a couple of, couple of hundred milliseconds, that was probably a mistake. And if that's happening on your website at scale and happening often enough, Google can apply what they call a two-click penalty. And this can be really nasty for your business. So by default, your ad looked like this big yellow one up here. Someone comes along, they click on it, and instead of going where they want to go, they get this little overlay and a little button that says, you really sure you want to do that? Uh, and this will happen you know, even for intentional ad clicks. And you know, a lot of people know at this stage it's unusual behavior. But if you see unusual behavior on, on the web, a lot of people will sort of throw their hands up and go, oh, I don't know what's happening here, but it's, it's not something I expected. I'm going to back my way out of here. Um, and then even if they were intending on clicking the ad, they, they walk away. The really fun thing here is that Google won't tell you that they've done this to you. It will just happen. And they don't show it to every user. So it's entirely possible if this is happening on your website, that you and everyone in work is working away on the website, you're seeing ads, everything looks normal, whereas this is happening for your users. So you know, how do we know? How do we even know it's happening? Well, it's normally because whoever's in charge of the ad ops comes running in with their hair on fire and screaming about you know, lines going vertically down, and we'll be bankrupt in six weeks if we don't fix it. So it, it, it can be fairly insidious. So yes, publishers are very much incentivized to avoid this. And the way you avoid it, it's, it's relatively simple from a, a front-end perspective. It's making sure that your ads have 
you know, these little labels, bit of spacing, and bit of, bit of padding around them, and keep them away from things like uh, menu buttons and action buttons where someone could accidentally click them. So very hard to get rid of this penalty. So prevention is, is very much better than cure. So we can avoid the two-click penalty, but it, it doesn't help us with that CLS jumping that we saw there a moment ago. And the good news is the solution for that is very similar to what we've already done with our images. So we have an idea of what sort of size we want the ads to be in. So we'll just declare a little min height utility class. We'll put that in, and uh, then we'll reserve the space. So when we have a slow loading ad like this, there's no jumping going on. Just the image very slowly comes in, and we're, we're all good from that side of things. But in much the same way that we have responsive images, there can be responsive ad code as well. So you can have, uh, you can tell Google, hey, uh, I'm happy on mobile devices to take this size of ad, and on desktop, this size of ad. Google will, they'll often, but not always listen to you. Sometimes Google will give you back a bigger ad than you've asked for, because they've figured, well, this one will make a little bit money for both of us, so we'll put it in and things will stretch out. So what can you do about that? Well, one option is this kind of approach here. You'll see on some sites where you find the biggest possible size you could serve, you create a, a big height for it, and you just center the ad in the middle. I mean, it works. You, you won't have a, a CLS problem, but most of the time, your site, it's, it's just going to look a bit, ah, it looks a bit cheap. It, it, it doesn't look great. So if you're dealing with ads at a lot high scale, you're probably going to end up using Google's Ad Manager product at some point. And this has a really nice feature in it where you have a, a render-ended callback. So whenever the ad loads, we can see what size was our ad. Was it bigger or smaller than the, the space that we had? And if it was smaller, we can take away our minimum height, so the ad unit will collapse, just fit nice and neatly around the ad that we have there, and, and have that nice kind of effect. Now, you might be thinking about that and saying, well, if we had the space originally and now we've withdrawn it, are we not effectively baking in some CLS all the time there? And, and it's true, we do to a degree, but it's, the thing with these metrics is it's all about balancing the metrics against the real world experience. You know, they're, they're not absolutes. And uh, the important thing there is that we're making sure that whatever min height we're setting is that of our most popular ad unit. So if like 90% of the ad units in this particular slot are 200 pixels in height, then we use 200 pixels in height, because then 90% of our users get a perfect experience and it'll shudder around a little bit for the others. And this is a, an experiment we ran on a popular Irish news website we work with not so long ago. You can see the before and after here. This big red line was people with poor CLS, and it, it dropped by about 64% overnight. And these were results that were repeated on a few different websites we went. So it, this can be a very effective technique, but regularly reviewing the size of those popular sl slots is critical, because if you get that wrong, then yeah, you're going to bake in a lot more CLS along the way. So that's something we can do to kind of take care of ads. So we've kind of put, put images in a box, we put ads there, now we're going to look at the next guy, videos. Videos, everybody loves a video. Uh, very popular way of sharing content, great for user engagement, super with SEO. Uh, even when you're, you know, you're searching for, how do I change the, the battery in my car key fob? You know, maybe I, I want an article with an image and two sentences and there's 10 minute videos I have to sit through. But generally speaking, uh, SEO, Google really love videos and showing them. And we saw earlier, really, really easy to embed. But well, the problem with videos is that they can bring hugely expensive payloads for us when we're trying to deal with our, our speed issues. So how expensive is it really? Well, we get complaints about the JavaScript execution time. Uh, we get complaints about the amount of unused JavaScript. So you think about YouTube, it's the one embed code that needs to work for every browser on every device in the world. So they will ship a lot of code that handles weird bugs in different browsers so that it will work well for everyone. But if you're running the latest Chrome or Safari, you're not going to be running half of this code, but everyone gets the same payload. Um, it, maybe it's the, the engineers in YouTube. Maybe they're the guys who still need to support IE 11. They, they have all this extra code in there for that. But we get the same complaint about uh, CSS as well. And then we also get told, well, there's some of the resources we're loading. PageSpeed Insights will tell us we can swap them out with a facade. So a facade in this case means that we'll have a, a very lightweight implementation, which when interacted with, loads are heavier implementation. The, the, the idea is that we have a faster initial load without taking the, the full hit on the page speed. And we can do that with a thing called web components. So we can see here we have a web component. For those of you who haven't looked at web components before, you can basically invent your own HTML tags. And in this case, we have something called light YouTube. We'll give it an ID, which will be our, our player ID, a little bit of JavaScript and, and CSS that defines what that element should actually be. And this example was created by a guy called uh, Paul Irish, who does a lot of uh, great stuff around page speed. And in this case, this component will load in a placeholder image based on that ID. Whenever someone hovers or comes near it, it's going to make a DNS prefetch to make the connection warm to YouTube. The idea being that when someone then clicks and interacts with it, we swap in the, the actual player really quickly. 
It's this last bit that made me very nervous because I've seen plenty of poor implementations before where you know, we're, we're going to show this static thing and when you click it, something exciting will load in and it can be very juddery, you can, the experience can be kind of poor. This works very well because it's A, very lightweight and it does a lot of this warming. So you can see you know, a regular connection here. We started with a facade here, it loads in a video, very, very smooth. And if we want to look at the, the impact on our performance, we we'll reduce this to its most simple base case. So this is a, a YouTube embed, it's a page, we have a H1, we have a YouTube embed, nothing else going on, we load the page, we don't even click the video. Our browser is going to make about 24 requests, pulling down all the different parts of the, the, the player, loading all the assets, about a megabyte, 300 something milliseconds being added, just from having this on the page. We haven't interacted with it or done anything at all with it. By contrast, if we're using our light one here, so again, we have the H1, we have the custom element, we've also in this case got the CSS and the, the JavaScript to, to control it a little bit there, six requests and 37 kilobytes loading in 52 uh, milliseconds. And we could probably get those requests down even lower. The, JSS, the JS and the CSS is quite lightweight. You could, you could probably inline it. But it's a significant change uh, that you can get by swapping one for the other. Now, the one thing, if you do this, one thing you need to be wary of is the SEO impact. So Google is great at recognizing when you have embedded videos. It'll pull out all of the rich data and give you the credit for that in, in the search rankings it doesn't have a clue what to do with these custom components. So if you have these, there is a video object JSON LD schema. This, don't need to worry too much about the details of this code here, but it's basically just saying what the title is, where the video actually lives, all the information that Google can automatically pull from uh, YouTube, you get from here. Uh, so that's something you'll just need to be aware of. You get the, the benefits of the page speed, just a little bit of extra work to do by making sure that you're, you're outputting this, this schema. So now that's videos put in the corner, and we move on to fonts. Fonts are a key part of a dynamic, attractive web, it says here. So um, yeah, brand personality, they make the web look a little bit nicer than they, it would otherwise be, but they can come a bit of a cost. And you probably recognize this sort of code sample. This has looked pretty much the same for about 20 years, going back to W3 schools, and every time you Google, what's my CSS declaration, you see, what are we calling our font? What are all of the different font files we're loading, and the weight, and so on? And we're loading all of these different types. Why do we load different types? Well, different browsers support different types. WAF2 is relatively new, it's, it's very efficient, but what's the support like? Well, it's pretty good. So if we look at this and we say, okay, well, all the browsers we care about are very happy with WAF2 and have been for a long time. We go back to this glacial code here that uh, has been doing the rounds for, well, since the year dot, you know, the same as all of these WordPress templates that still have a conditional IE9 style sheets in them, we go back to this and we say, well, let's just get rid of this, delete those binary files, and we've just tidied things up a bit. It's not gonna make a big difference to our page speed, but we're just cleaning the house as we go here. It's one small thing we can do, and then we look at our, our font itself. So what is a font file? Font file is ultimately a giant lookup table. We'll have all of the different characters, your ABC, one, two, three, all of that sort of stuff, and beside those characters, we'll have whatever the font in question thinks that character should look like. And the font file will have a huge number of characters, and what you'll often find is that font files have characters for multiple languages in them. So we might have a font that will have all of the Latin characters supporting uh, English, French, Spanish, German, um, a lot of the Western European languages, but they might also have Cyrillic characters, they might have Japanese, they might have Chinese, they could have all kinds of characters inside it. And if you think about your application, if your application is Again, maybe it's an application that is being, uh, it's written in English or it's written in Spanish, it's targeted at a Western European audience. You're probably not producing a lot of content in Cyrillic or in, in, in Japanese. But every time you send a font file down, you're sending a big part of your payload containing that information. So what if we could take our font file and just chop it down to only send the characters that we, we know we're gonna use? That's a technique called subsetting. And this is a significant thing that uh, you can impact, it impact uh, that can impact your page speed and that you can do relatively simply. I'll, I'll show you how complex this is. There's a tool called Glyphhanger, and this is all it is. So we'll install Glyphhanger, and then what we're gonna tell it is we want uh, to take just the Latin characters, we want you to subset all of the fonts in this particular directory. Uh, we are still using WAF for some reason, so while you're at it, convert them to WAF2, please. And we get a massive, massive saving there. So we can see we tried this on one of our, our Irish news websites, and again, five or six fonts, about 400 kilobytes loading initially, subset it, it's down to 138, so nearly two-third reduction in the size of the font files that come down. The nice thing with the font file coming down in size is that it's unblocking everything a little bit more, uh, a little bit sooner. So 
while the, the initial page load will be faster, we have a bit of a, a knock-on effect as well. So we talk about our, our LCP, for example, our, our, that's normally our big image. And you'll see all of the, the mentions in PageSpeed tool will be about optimizing your image. You know, is your image small enough? Is it the right size? Is it the right file type? But if we have our, our metric here, what this is measuring is how long from the page being requested until the image loads, the image doesn't even start loading until we've gotten a lot of the blocking issues out of the way, which includes the fonts. So if we have fonts taking this long and we shrink it down here, suddenly our images are loading a bit sooner and our LCP metric gets a little bit better as well. So this can have a really big knock-on effect from what we saw with, with Glyphanger here. Absolutely tiny, tiny bit of change to make. You can have a huge impact here. The point about LCP that, and, and the metrics in general that's important to remember is that uh, it's rarely just one thing that impacts these metrics. There's often several different things coming in at the same time. So it's very important to keep like a, a holistic view of what's going on here. So imagine that you are walking along the, uh, you know, some beautiful tropical paradise here. So I say tropical paradise, I don't know, you think of the Caribbean or Mediterranean or Newcastle or somewhere like that. And as you're walking along, you come across this, this thing on the, the shore and you see it and it's, it's big, it's massive, it looks kind of familiar, but you're not 100% what exactly this thing is. You're poking at it, you're forming ideas, you're coming up with theories. You shift it to the side and you start to see, oh, okay, these things look a bit like, well, maybe that's it's a rib cage and these, these tusky looking lads, I think, okay, maybe they give the game away here. We think we know what this is. It's probably an elephant. You know, is it an African elephant, a European elephant? It's, it's hard to know, but we can say here, yeah, these are probably the tusks. This big thing here, oh yeah, that, that would have been where the trunk comes out of. So we've, we've got a sort of a, an holistic view of it. Now, if you went back to our tropical beach maybe 3,000 years ago, maybe you're in, in ancient Greece, and you're walking down the shore and you see this guy, you focus, you get the blinkers on and you go laser focus on this thing, and you're trying to figure out, well, what could it be? I mean, it looks, it's, it's kind of like a skull, it's big, but this thing up here, I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, so you do the, the only thing that makes sense, and you decide, this uh, must have been from a prehistoric race of giant men with one single eye. So the Cyclops reigned over us because you've gone, you've gone laser and you've created a very compelling narrative, very interesting story, but because you've been so focused on the one point, you've kind of lost the, the wood for the trees, as it were. So the point here is uh, make sure that you're, you're paying attention to each step in the chain as it can really make a big difference as you have a, a knock-on effect there. Now, a question that comes up all of the time is, what happens if I do this subsetting and someone then tries to use a character that isn't in my font set? So what'll happen here is your browser will, first of all, take whatever the letter is, and it'll try running through any fonts in the family you've defined. If it strikes out on all of them, can't find anything, it'll fall back to the character that the user has in one of their system fonts. Uh, if the system font doesn't even have a representation, then there's something very weird going on. You might have a blank space or a placeholder box or something like this. In practice, it's, it's kind of vanishingly rare. So like you take the example, let's say we've, we've chopped out all of our Chinese characters and someone in China comes to our website, maybe runs it through Google Translate. That person is probably gonna have Chinese on their system font in the first place. So in practice, it's, it's quite rare that you would fall back to the empty case. But there are some high profile cases where a font has a character defined and uh, it, it behaves a little bit differently in practice than the creators might have imagined. So you might have had this happen to you in the past, that you get some email at some point and it all makes sense. And then at the end, there's a random J or K or L or, or something like that thrown in there. And it, it, it's weird, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And what's happening here is that somebody is using Microsoft Outlook and they've tried to finish their message with a smiley, happy, sad, or straight face indifferent. And in Microsoft, in Windows, they had the Wingdings font. So the Wingdings font was great fun to play around with in, in Microsoft Word, but it basically took every letter you typed and made it into some kind of icon and the smiley faces were JKL. And uh, what would happen here is that you would send the mail, it would say, okay, JKL, great, but if you send it to someone who doesn't have wingdings, you end up with this sort of thing. So this is a, even the big guys make mistakes like this. With the sub subsetting, you have Google Fonts, and with Google Fonts, you can actually do it directly in the URL. Uh, you can pick a subset, or you can pick specific characters. Now, the thing with Google Fonts is that Historically, the advantage of Google Fonts was that if you had a popular font on your site, you could probably be guaranteed your users had seen it somewhere else, you would get the benefit of the shared cache. Browser security models now mean that that shared cache doesn't exist anymore, so you're gonna take the penalty for the DNS hit, the page loading, all of that sort of stuff. So you're really better off to self-host the Google Fonts and then subset them yourself. Uh, it'll uh, surprise you to learn there is a Spashy package for that as well. Um, so uh, that's, that's a cool one worth checking out. So at this point now, we're happy we've put each of these lads into a box. We've got big page speed changes. We've, we've made a lot, of, a lot of changes here with relatively little effort. We haven't got bogged down in front-end package development or any, any sort of compilation stuff. So what are we gonna do next? Well, 
nay, we can actually take a holiday for a few months, take a bit of time off. Uh, but the problem is that this sphere is, is so fast moving and it changes quite a lot that you know, by, by the, the time we, we, we look at this again in three or four months, it's possible that browsers will be doing a lot of the stuff that, uh, that I've talked about today out of the box and, and it moves so quickly. So there's a few people here it's worth kind of keeping an eye on. Uh, just to keep your, your, kinda your ear to the ground in this area. Uh, Adi Osmani, uh, Chrome engineering lead, talks a lot about web performance and browser features. Rick Viscomi is the, the DevRel at Chrome, uh, he, a lot of writing about core web values and working with that data. Web.dev is where a lot of these articles end up. That's really accessible, really clear, clear-eyed code samples, great one worth checking out. I uh, mentioned Spashy a few times, they have a lot of packages there. Uh, I do feel a little bit like you know, recommending Spashy at a PHP conference is like bursting excitedly into the bar and saying, hey, have you guys ever heard about beer? I think you're really gonna like it. You know, everyone knows Spashy there, uh, but definitely we're keeping an eye on in, in, in this space as well. And uh, that, is, that is me. So uh, thank you for your, your time and attention. Uh, I'll be around the rest of the day if you uh, have any, any kind of questions or if you're particularly passionate about front-end development and want to corner me and shout at me about how the upgrade cycles on NPM and Node are a good thing, actually. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, to talk. So thanks again. Thanks, folks.